Imperialism and World Economy by Nikolai Bukharin, Chapter 1, World Economy Defined. The struggle between national states, which is nothing but the struggle between the respective groups of the bourgeoisie, is not suspended in the air. One cannot picture this gigantic conflict in the conflict of two bodies in a vacuum. On the contrary, the very conflict is conditioned by the special medium in which the national economic organisms live and grow. <clears throat> the latter, however, have long ceased being a secluded whole, an isolated economy a la fict or tunin. On the contrary, they are only parts of a much larger sphere, namely world economy, just as every individual enterprise is part of the national economy. So every one of these national economies is included in the system of world economy. This is why the struggle between modern national economic bodies must be regarded, first of all, as the struggle of various competing parts of world economy, just as we consider the struggle of individual enterprises to be one of the phenomena of socio-economic life. Thus, the problem of studying imperialism, its economic characteristics and its future, reduces itself to the problem of analyzing the tendencies in the development of world economy and of the probable changes in its inner structure. Before we approach this problem, however, we must first of all agree as to what we understand by the expression world economy. The basis of social life is the production of material goods. In modern society, which produces not products as such, but commodities, i.e. products destined for exchange, the process of the exchange of various products expresses the division of labor between the economic units that produce those commodities. Such division of labor, in contra contradistinction to the division of labor within the framework of a single enterprise, is termed by Marx the social division of labor. Social division of labor can obviously assume various forms. They may be, for instance, division of labor between various enterprises within a country, or there may be division of labor between various branches of production. There may also be division of labor between such large subdivisions of the entire economic life as, for instance, industry and agriculture, and there be, may be division of labor between countries that represent separate economic systems inside of the general system, etc. It is possible to propose various divisions, to advance more than one basis for the classification of economic forms, depending upon the aims pursued by the investigation. What is important for us in this connection is the fact that, alongside of other forms of social division of labor, there exists a division of labor between national economies, between various countries, a division of, of labor which oversteps the boundaries of the national economy, an international division of labor. There exist two kinds of prerequisites for an international division of labor. Natural prerequisites conditioned by the differences of the natural medium in which the various production organisms live, and prerequisites of a social nature conditioned by the differences in the cultural level, the economic structure, and the development of productive forces in the various countries. Let us start with the former. Different communities discover in their natural environment different means for production and subsistence. Consequently, their methods of production, modes of life, and products are different. It is owing to the existence of these spontaneously developed differences that when communities come into contact, there occurs an exchange of their several products one for another, so that these products gradually become transformed into commodities. Exchange does not create the difference between the spheres of production. It brings the differing spheres of production into relation one with another and thus transforms them into more or less interde interdependent branches of a social collective production. This difference in the spheres of production results here from the differences in the natural conditions of production. It is not difficult to find numerous illustrations for this assertion. Let us, for example, take the vegetable kingdom. <clears throat> Coffee can be produ produced only under certain climatic conditions. 
It is grown mainly in Brazil, partly in Central America, to a much lesser degree in Africa, Abyssinia, British, British Central Africa, German East Africa, and in Asia, Dutch India, British India, Arabia, Malacca. Cocoa can be produced only in tropical countries. Rubber, a product playing a very large part in modern production, also requires certain climatic conditions, and its production is limited to a few countries, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Guiana, etc. Cotton, a product occupying the first rank among all fibrous plants due to its importance in economic life, is produced in the United States, India, Egypt, China, Asia Minor, and the Russian Central Asia territories, which takes the second place, is ex or wait, jute, which takes the second place, is exported from one country only, namely from India. If we take the production of minerals, we find the same picture, since we deal here to a certain extent with what is known as the natural resources of a country. Coal, for instance, is exported from countries with large coal deposits, England, Germany, United States, Austria, etc. Kerosene is produced in countries having an abundance of oil, United States, the Caucasus, Holland, India, Romania, Galicia, Iron ore is extracted in Spain, Sweden, France, Algeria, Newfoundland, Cuba, etc. Manganese ore is to be found mainly in the Caucasus and southern Russia, India, and Brazil. Copper deposits are in abundance mostly in Spain, Japan, British South Africa, German Southwest Africa, Australia, Canada, United States, Mexico, Chile, and Bolivia. Important as the natural differences in the conditions of production may be, they recede more and more into the background compared with differences that are the outcome of the uneven development of productive forces in the various countries. It must be emphasized that natural conditions are only of relative importance as regards pro production relations, as well as commerce and transport, i.e. their negative or positive significance depends on a high degree upon the cultural level of man. While natural conditions, measured by the human yardstick of time and space, may be regarded a constant or may be, may be regarded constant entities, the cultural level of man is a changing entity. And no matter <clears throat> and no matter how important the differences in the natural conditions of a country may be for production and transport, the cultural differences are certainly as important and only the combined action of both forces produces the phenomena of economic life. Coal deposits, for instance, may be dead capital in the absence of technical and economic prerequisites for their extraction. On the other hand, mountains formerly obstructing com communication, swamps making production difficult, and the like, lose their negative significance in a country with a highly developed technique tunnels, irrigation works, etc. Still, more important for us is the circumstance that the unequal development of production forces creates different economic types and different production spheres, thus increasing the scope of international social division of labor. We have in mind the difference between industrial countries importing agricultural products and exporting manufactured goods and agrarian countries exporting the products of agricultural production and importing the products of industry. The foundation of all highly developed divisions of labor that are brought about by the exchange of commodities is the cleavage between town and country. We may say that the whole economic history of society is summarized in the development of this cleavage. The cleavage between town and country, as well as the development of this cleavage, formerly confined to one country only, are now being reproduced on a tremendously enlarged basis. Viewed from this standpoint, entire countries appear today as towns, namely the industrial countries, whereas entire agrarian territories appear to be country. International division of labor coincides here with the division of labor between the two largest branches of social production as a whole, between industry and agriculture. Thus, appearing as the so-called general division of labor. This can be clearly realized by comparing the localities where the products of industry and 
agriculture are produced. Wheat is mainly produced in Canada in the agrarian sections of the United States, in Argentina, Australia, and Western India, in Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary. Rye is produced mainly in Russia. Meat is delivered by Australia and New Zealand, the United States, agrarian sections, Canada, which specializes in large-scale production of meat, Argentina, Denmark, Holland, etc. Livestock is exported mainly from the agrarian countries of Europe into the industrial countries. The centers of European production of livestock are Hungary, Holland, Denmark, Spain, Portugal, Russia, and the Balkan countries. Timber is furnished by Sweden, Finland, Norway, Northern Russia, partly by some sections of former Austria-Hungary. The export of timber from Canada has also begun to increase. If then we were to single out the countries that export manufactured goods, they would prove to be the most developed industrial countries of the world. Cotton fabrics are primarily placed upon the market by Great Britain, then follow Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, and in the Western Hemisphere of the United States. Woolen goods are produced for the world market by Great Britain, France, Germany, Austria, Belgium, etc. Iron and steel products are manufactured mainly, in, mainly by Great Britain, Germany, and the United States. The three countries that have attained the highest level, level of industrialism. The second place in this respect is occupied by a group consisting of Belgium, France, and Austria, Hungary. Chemicals are produced by Germany, which in this respect occupies the first place, then by England, the United States, France, Belgium, and Switzerland. We thus observe a peculiar distribution of the productive forces of world capitalism. The main subdivisions of social labor are separated by the line that divides two types of countries. Social labor proves to be divided on an international scale. International division of labor finds its expression in international exchange. Inasmuch as the producers do not come into social contact until they exchange their labor products, the specifically social character of their individual labor does not manifest itself until exchange takes place. In other words, the labor of individuals becomes an effective part of the aggregate of social labor solely in virtue of the relations which the process of exchange establishes between the labor products and consequently between the producers. The social labor of the world as a whole is divided among the various countries. The labor of every individual country becomes part of that world social labor through the exchange that takes place on an international scale. This interdependence of countries brought about by the process of exchange is by no means an accident. It is a necessary condition for continued social growth. International exchange thereby turns into a process of socio-economic life governed by definite laws. The socio-economic life of the world would be entirely disorganized if America or Australia ceased exporting their wheat and livestock. England and Belgium their coal, Russia grain and raw materials, Germany its machines and the products of the chemical industry, India, Egypt and the, and the United States cotton, etc. On the other hand, the countries that export the products of agriculture would be doomed to destruction were the markets for those products suddenly closed. This is particularly evident as regards the so-called monocultural countries, i.e. such as produce one such as produce one single product, coffee in Brazil, cotton in Egypt, etc. How indispensable international exchange is at present for the normal process of economic life may be seen from the following examples. During the first third of the 19th century, England imported only 2.5% of foodstuffs needed for its population. Now it imports about 50% of its grain, of wheat even as much as 80%, 50% of its meat, 70% of its butter, 50% of its cheese, etc. According to Lexis's calculations, the foreign market has for the Belgian manufacturers a significance equal to that of the home market in England. The home market hardly absorbs double the amount of manufactured goods, metals, and coal that is to be exported. In Germany, the home market exceeds the foreign mar market 4 to 4.5 times. According to Ballad, 
England imports between three-fourths and four-fifths of all the necessary wheat, and between 40 and 50 percent of its meat. Germany imports 24 to 30 percent of its breadstuffs, about 60 percent of its fodder, and 5 to 10 percent of its meat. <coughs> the number of examples could be increased indefinitely. One thing is clear from the above. There is a regular market connection through the process of exchange between numberless individual economies scattered over the most diverse, diverse geographical areas. Thus, world division of labor and international exchange presuppose the existence of a world market and world prices. The level of prices is, generally speaking, not determined by production costs, as is the case in local or national production. To a very large extent, national and local differences are leveled out in the general resultant of world prices, which in their turn exert pressure on individual producers, individual countries, individual territories. This is particularly manifest in the case of such commodities as coal and iron, wheat and cotton, coffee and wool, meat and sugar. The production of grains may serve as an example. Conditions of grain production differ widely in the various countries, whereas the price deviations are by no means as great. The conditions of wheat production in England and America are widely different. Yet, wheat prices are almost the same at the London and New York markets, 139 and 141 marks per kilogram, respectively. This is due to the fact that an immense stream of American wheat is continually pouring over the Atlantic Ocean into England and Western Europe in general. The formation and the movement of these world prices may be seen most clearly in the commodity exchanges of the largest cities of the world, London, New York, Berlin, where world prices are registered daily. Information comes in from every corner of the world, and thus world demand and world supply are being taken into account. International exchange of commodities is based on the international division of labor. We must not think, however, that it takes place only within the limits set by the latter. Countries mutually exchange not only different products, but even products of the same kind. A, for instance, may export into B not only such products as are not produced in B or produced in a very small quantity, it may export its commodities into B to compete with local production. In such cases, international exchange has its basis, not in division of labor, which presupposes the production of different use values, but solely in different levels of production costs and values having various scales in the various countries, but reduced through international exchange to socially indispensable labor on a world scale. How closely the various countries have become knitted by the process of the exchange of commodities may be seen from the economy and means of payment, i.e. economy in the transportation of gold bullion. If, on the one hand, we were to add the export of bullion of a certain country to its import, on the other hand, the export of commodities of country to its import, it would be seen that the value of bullion shipments was never more than 5% of the value of commodity shipments. Besides, we must not forget that the trade balance of a country is only a portion of its balance of payments. Just as there is formed a world commodity market in the sphere of commodity exchange, so there is formed a world market of money, capital. This is expressed in an international equalization of the interest and discount rates. Thus, the element of finance also shows a tendency to aid in substituting for the market conditions of an individual country, the world market conditions. The example of the commodity market shows that behind the market relations, there are hidden production relations. Any connection between producers who meet in the process of exchange presupposes the individual labor labors of the producers having already become elements of the combined labor of a social whole. Thus, production is hidden behind exchange. Production relations are hidden behind exchange relations. The interrelation of producers is, is hidden behind the interrelation of commodities, where connections established through the, the process of exchange are not, a, not of an accidental nature. We have a stable system of production relations which forms the economic structure of society. 
Thus, we may define world economy as a system of production relations and correspondingly of exchange relations on a world scale. One must not assume, however, that production relations are established solely in the process of commodity exchange. Whenever human beings work for one another in any way, their labor acquires a social form. In other words, whatever, whatever the form of connections established between producers, whether directly or indirectly, once the connection has been established and has acquired a stable character, we may speak of a system of production relations, i.e. of the growth or formation of a social economy. It thus appears that commodity exchange is one of the most primitive forms of expressing production relations. Present day highly complicated economic life knows a great variety of forms behind which production relations are hidden. When, for instance, the shares of an American enterprise are, brought, are bought at the Berlin Stock Exchange, production relations are thereby established between the German capitalist and the American worker. When a Russian city obtains a loan from London capitalists and pays interest on the loan, then this is what happens. Part of the surplus value expressing the relation that exists between the English worker and the English capitalist is transformed to the municipal government of a Russian city. The latter, in paying interest, gives away part of the surplus value received by the, by the bourgeoisie of that city and expressing the production relations existing between the Russian worker and the Russian capitalist. Thus, connections are established both between the workers and the capitalists of two countries. Of particular significance is the role of the ever-growing movement of money capital, which we have noted above. A number of other forms of economic relations may be observed, like emigration and immigration, migration of the labor power, partial transfer of the wages of immigrant labor, sending money home, establishment of enterprises abroad, and the movement of the surplus value obtained, profits of steamship companies, etc. We shall still return to this. At present, we only wish to note that world economy includes all these economic phenomena, which, all in all, are based on the relations between human beings engaged in the process of production. By and large, the whole process of world economic life in modern times reduces itself to the production of surplus value and its distribution among the various groups and subgroups of the bourgeoisie on the basis of an ever-widening reproduction of the relations between two classes the class of the world proletariat on the one hand, and the world bourgeoisie on the other. World economy is one of the pieces of social economy in general. By social economy, the science of political economy understands, first of all, a system of individual economies interlinked by exchange. From this point of view, it is perfectly obvious that social economy by no means presupposes an economic subject guiding the totality of economic relations. What political economy has in mind here is not economy as a planned teleological entity conducting economic activities, but first of all, an unorganized system of eco e economies devoid of a conscious collective management where, on the contrary, the economic laws are the elemental laws of the market and of production subordinated to the market. This is why the term social economy in general as well as the term world economy in particular, by no means requires regulation as an indispensable defining characteristic. Up to the present time, the national economic organisms have proved unable to exercise a general regulating influence on the international market where anarchy continues to prevail, since this is the battleground of the national interests, i.e. the interests of the national commanding classes. Notwithstanding this fact, World economy remains world economy.